Welcome back. In this video, we'll cover queues and stacks. We'll see where and how you can use them in your Unity game and check out lots of examples. This is a multi-part series on data structures, the first of which covers lists, arrays, and a bunch of fundamentals for this video, so I recommend you check that out, especially if you're a beginner. I've also covered hash sets and dictionaries, which can be really useful, but this video on queues and stacks doesn't directly build on those. So queues and stacks are similar in a lot of ways, which is why we cover them both in a single video. We'll check out queues first, which probably have more meaningful real-world applications in games than stacks, but you can definitely use both to your advantage. So a queue data structure is pretty self-explanatory. Just like a real-world queue, things go in, then stay in the order they were put in, and then come back out in that same order. Except in real life, people may be skipping the line and leaving the queue earlier than they should. Anyway, let's define an example C-sharp queue. As always with generic C-sharp collections, you have to specify the data type of the elements you're storing, in this case integers. We could also store strings, game objects, or any other data type. The fundamental properties of a queue are that you can only add items at the back of the queue and remove items from the front of the queue. To do so, you would call the dequeue and enqueue methods. The items are always kept in order, so whatever you put in first will come out before anything you put in after that. This is the first in, first out principle. Anyway, you can iterate over all the items in a queue, so you can access them one by one and, for example, check if it contains a specific item. However, you can't remove or insert an item in the middle of the queue. I am currently working on a little train game called On Track. It's still work in progress, but I already have a few neat examples of queues making my code simpler and shorter. So the game periodically spawns new trains that then move through the level, while the player needs to make sure they end up at a depot of the same color by operating the railway switches. Depending on the level, the track network may have tracks merging together or simple crossings. I don't want trains to just move on top of each other in such places, which really doesn't look very nice. So let's use crossings for the example, but merge points work in exactly the same way. To organize traffic, each crossing keeps track of any lined up trains in a queue of game objects. It uses a collider to detect and register incoming trains, and when it's already occupied as another train arrives, the train stops and is enqueued to the crossing's queue of waiting trains. Whenever a train leaves the crossing, as detected by the collider as well, I check if there is a train waiting in line and dequeue it so it continues its journey. Note that the queue behavior is exactly what we want here. If we let lined up trains continue in random order or always from the same preferred track, that will not balance out very well. So let's take a look at how Unity's c -sharp queue is implemented to figure out if enqueuing and dequeuing are also fast operations. Just like a list, the queue uses an array to store elements internally, and it keeps track of the front and back of the actual queue within the array using the head and tail index. So at some point in time, an integer queue may look like this internally. Now, enqueuing an item simply means adding the item at the tail position and adjusting the tail index. But what happens now? The percent sign is the modulo operator, and it will always return the remainder of a division. In our case, the tail index was previously set to 8, and adding 1 to that would cause the index to move out of the array's bounds. So the modulo operation here returns 0, which is the remainder of dividing 8 plus 1 by 9. Note that the array is indexed starting at 0, so this array is currently 9 elements long. And now you can probably guess how dequeuing works. Of course, the queue may eventually reach its internal array's capacity limit, which is when the entire array needs to be copied to a new bigger array, and that's just how the list implementation works, which we covered in the first video. By the way, you can usually tell any of these collection data structures in their constructors which internal capacity they should begin with if you like. Anyway, to answer our initial question, the NQ and DQ methods are always fast, no matter how long the queue is. If you, on the other hand, remove an item from the start of a list, that operation will become less efficient the longer your list is. That said, in practice, your runtime performance for all the data structures in this series, including lists, hash sets, and dictionaries from the previous videos, will depend on a lot of factors, like the patterns in which you allocate the stored objects in memory, the access patterns you use, how many elements you store, the size of the individual elements, your system's cache size and latency, and so on. But if you're a beginner, I really recommend not overthinking this or prematurely over-optimizing your code. 
Anyway, now that you understand perfectly how a queue works, here's another real-world use case. Giving a game character assignments to complete, like for example constructing buildings. The character could just keep a queue of work items and complete them one after another, which matches the queue concept perfectly. The player enqueues new assignments and the character dequeues one whenever a previous work item is complete. And with that, let's take a look at stacks. Like I mentioned, they're very similar to queues. You can add items to a stack by calling the push method and you can remove items by calling the pop method. As you can see, the latter is where stacks and queues work differently. While the queues dequeue method will always give you the first item you put in the queue, a stack will give you the last one you've put in. That's the last in first out principle as opposed to the first in first out principle that applies to queues. One very obvious example for stacks could be piles of cards in a card game. Players can only add cards to the top of the pile and draw cards from the top of the pile. Here's what a basic implementation could look like. Note, just like we did when dequeuing items from a queue, we need to check if the stack is empty before removing and returning the topmost item, since it would otherwise throw an exception. Of course, a stack will no longer work well if there are extra rules in the card game that let you, for example, draw a card from the bottom of the pile or add cards to a random location in the pile or things like that. By the way, the internal implementation of the stack is not too spectacular. It works exactly like the list data structure works. An internal array holds all the elements and its size is expanded by a growth factor whenever so many elements have been pushed to the stack that the internal array's capacity is reached. This may now make you wonder what the point of using a stack would be in the first place since it is basically a more limited version of a list. And you wouldn't be wrong. Stacks are pretty specialized and their advantages come from their limitations and specialized behavior. You can only do a few very specific things, but you can do them with less code and probably in a slightly safer way than if you used a list. Let's compare the draw card method for the stack with one that uses a list. You need to do a few additional things here, like defining the index of the card you want to grab, storing the topmost card and then removing it before finally returning that removed card. Also, if you don't know how the internal list implementation works, you would maybe instead use the beginning of the list as the top of the pile rather than the back, which would result in the draw and add operations taking longer and longer the bigger your list gets. That's because the entire internal array for the list is copied every time you add or remove an element at the beginning. Anyway, let me know in the comments below if you have another good example use case for stacks or if you think they're mostly useless. So let's conclude by looking at object pooling, which is a neat and common use case in game dev for both queues and stacks. Imagine you have a game object that you constantly need to create and destroy many instances of. A good example could be enemies that are spawning and getting killed or rapidly firing bullets from a gun. Or in on track, I constantly need to spawn new trains and destroy those that have reached their depot. However, frequently instantiating and destroying objects is pretty inefficient and it may become an issue if you have to do it a lot as would be likely for the bullet case. So in OnTrack, instead of destroying trains when they reach their depot, I just set those trains inactive so that their instances still remain in memory. Then when it's time to spawn a new train, I can just reuse one of the inactive train objects so I don't have to instantiate anything. That's a pooling system and one way to keep track of the inactive game objects would be a stack or queue. Both data structures let me conveniently get and remove an item from the pool using a single fast method, DQ or POP, and they both let me easily and efficiently add an object to the pool using NQ and PUSH. So like I said, let me know if you have other interesting examples, maybe even from your own games. We're now concluding this video series on data structures. Let me know if this was useful. I haven't previously created any educational videos, so I'd be happy to get some feedback. Thanks for watching and good luck with your own game, which I'm sure will use a ton of extremely fancy data structures now.